Welcome to the lecture series under the ages of e Sikshana program, an excellent initiative by VTU Karnataka. This is Professor Umar Rao bringing you the lecture series on transmission and distribution. So, in the last session, I just introduced you to reliability and we saw that reliability includes both availability and quality. That means, my product must be available for use and also it should be working as per requirement. So, in this session, we will look deeper into the concepts of reliability as applied to distribution systems. So, the downtime costs of electric power are very high. So, when you talk of downtime, you mean the time when the product is down, that means the product cannot be used, it is not available. So, power is also a commodity. So, when I say downtime of power means power is not available to the consumer, that is the meaning of downtime. And I had shown you a video on black start of a grid. So, black start is after a complete blackout of the grid, when all the generators have failed, all the generators have tripped, the major transmission lines have tripped, the system is black it has been subjected to a blackout. So, from that state I have to start it that takes a lot of time because you know if you remember the case studies in a few seconds the entire grid can go out, but to put it back in place a lot of time is required and it could be anything between 48 to 72 hours that is 2 days to 3 days. Imagine a country like India where we have one national grid being without power for 2 or 3 days, the economic loss would be immense. Okay. Reliability assessment therefore, is the most important factor in designing and planning of distribution systems, so that they operate in an economic manner with minimal interruption of customer loads. A lot of focus was given to reliability of generating systems because they were capital intensive and initially and not much effort was given to reliability of distribution systems. However, the sensitive electronic equipment we use today and the automation of industries and the advent of internet, extensive communication, global interactions. So, these demand a very high degree of reliability and quality power supply today as compared to earlier days. Therefore, reliability of distribution systems has become a major topic of consideration in modern power systems. Moreover, the modern consumer is aware of the power sector, aware of the rights and duties and therefore, the demand from the consumer also has increased. So, today a consumer would not be ready to pay high tariffs if the system is not reliable. So, these factors have led to increased focus on reliability. So, let us formally define reliability. Reliability is a measure of the probability that an item or a collection of items will perform its intended function for a specified interval under stated conditions. Every word is important here. First, it is a probability. If I say my reliability probability is 0 0.98, so 98 percent, that means there is a 2 percent chance of failure. Okay, that is the meaning of the word probability. So, it could be a single item 
or it could be a system as a whole, a system if you consider when I say reliability of the distribution system, it is not one product, it is a collection of items. Okay? So, an item or a collection, collection of items. For example, if you take a vehicle, if you take a car, you can talk of reliability of the engine, you can talk of reliability of the battery and you can also talk of reliability of the car. Right? So, a battery is an item, the engine is an item, but the car per se is a collection of items. So, it should perform its intended function for a specified interval. So, I have to specify, no product can go on infinitely, right. So, for some what is the duration and under stated conditions. So, what if you look at for example, the advertisement for tyres, you know, you will find some tyres they say, you know, they show, show the jeeps going up mountains on boulders etcetera and still nothing happening to it. So, they are stating the condition, they are saying under those worst conditions, your tyre is still reliable. Okay. So, if I show my ad with, with a car, you know, going on a highway and then it fails on the hill. I can't say it is not reliable because it I have not stated the conditions that is the meaning. So, the period can vary from a specified time period to the entire life cycle of the item. So, every item has a life cycle after all it is made of material right. So, just like living organic living beings have life even the non living things also have a life because everything is made of matter. So, wear and tear is always there. So, this is the formal definition of reliability of any anything, any item, any system, any product. Next, let us define availability. Availability means, it is a measure of the percentage of time, the equipment is in an operable state, that is the uptime, how long it is operable. For example, we say the availability of a machine is 85 percent. That means, 85 percent of the time the machine is available. It is not available for 15 percent of the time. Why? Not necessary that it is there is a breakdown. I need periodic maintenance. You have a car, you give it for servicing once in 6 months. So, every 6 months it is not available for 1 day or 2 days, how much of a day, how many ever days it takes for servicing. So, availability percentage is measured as a ratio of uptime by total time. Total time is uptime plus downtime. So, as I said, the downtime could be because of a fault, a repair, or it could be because of a scheduled maintenance. I have a transmission line. When we discuss transmission lines, we saw that periodically they are out, removed out of service for maintenance, that is called as a scheduled maintenance. So, it will definitely have a downtime, right. So, that is the meaning of availability. So, we are very clear about the difference between reliability and availability. Both are interlinked. If it is not available, there is no question of talking about reliability at all, right. Adequacy, it is the quality of being sufficient and the ability to meet the needs. Is it adequate? Okay. Let us say, I have a load of 1000 megawatts okay? and I have a supply power all the time. So, let us say it is reliable and it is available, availability is 100 percent let us say just hypothetical situation, but I am getting only 800 megawatts. So, it is not adequate, it is reliable available, but not adequate, it is not sufficient to meet the demands. Okay? So, you see there are subtle differences between these words. And then security, security is like this. So, take the same example. So, I have 1000 megawatts demand, the system is reliable, available, adequate, but if a fault occurs in one of the lines, then the system cannot withstand. 
So you remember when we discussed feeders, we saw that if there are two parallel feeders, if one goes, the other can take up the load, provided it has the capacity to do it. And I told you that time it makes the system more reliable, that is security. So under normal conditions, there is no problem. But if there is a dynamic condition, a contingency, an emergency, then the system should be able to withstand it. So that is building redundancy into the system. So if my demand is 1000 megawatts and I have a supply of exactly 1000 megawatts and what if one of the generators fails, then I can't meet my load. So there is no security. Okay? So security is another aspect. So you see these are all different aspects but all of them go into reliability. So reliability, availability, adequacy, security. Security is like your bank balance. Right? So, if I spend whatever I have every month, then if an emergency occurs, I fall sick and I need money, I do not have any reserve. So, I am not secure, that is security. Got it? So, under normal conditions, my power system is able to supply the load, but if a fault occurs, there is no redundancy, there is no reserve, so it is not secure. So, this is another aspect, so very interesting. So, does this come without a price? You remember yesterday I told you in the previous sessions that there is no free lunch. There is no free lunch in, in the world. So to get something you have to pay something. So reliability costs money. If instead of one transmission line I want to put two transmission lines to improve reliability. If instead of using a radial feeder I use a parallel feeder or better still I use a ring feeder. I have to pay some extra cost, right? So, why do we buy some products even though they are expensive? Because they are reliable. That is the cost I am ready to pay for reliability, okay? So, the cost of reliability is twofold. One is what is the cost to the utility to provide reliable power to the consumer? The utility also has to spend money, it has to install parallel feeders. It has to install some excess redundant generating capacity which maybe is not used in the normal case. It has to improve its protection to make the system reliable. So the cost to the utility increases as the reliability increases, got it? Because the utility has to spend more money to give a reliable supply to the consumer, common sense. But does reliability cost me, the consumer, any money? Okay, let us take a case. My supply is not very reliable. In a day, I have 6 hours of power cut. I take 6 hours of power cut. I have 6 hours of power cut. So, what do you do as a consumer? You have a backup, maybe you have a backup generator or you have a UPS. So, from the consumer perspective, Reliability costs money to the consumer also because the consumer has to make up for the loss, for the unreliability. Okay, my quality, we, we spoke of quality also in reliability. It should be able to perform as intended, that is a part of reliability. So let us say because of poor power quality, my TV is spoilt. So I have to spend money on buying a new TV. That is the price I have to pay, yes? And because of low voltage, there is an issue with my fans. So that is the, my fan gets, got burnt, so that is the price I have to pay. So what are we trying to discuss here? Reliability costs money both to the supplier and to the consumer, right? Now, as the reliability goes up, who has to spend more? Let us say I want to have reliability of 100 percent, that means I never have a power outage. Who will ensure that the utility? Yes, obviously. So the utility will have to invest heavily on redundant lines, redundant feeders, redundant generators, very sophisticated protective equipment. So the cost to the utility goes up as the reliability goes up. And what about the customer? 
say instead of 6 hours of power cut, I have only 2 minutes of power cut in a day. I will say, okay, just 2 minutes in the day, no, I won't invest money on a backup generator or a UPS. Not necessary. So, the cost to the consumer will go down as reliability improves, is not it? Or what I will do only 2 minutes, so I will just have a small UPS just to you know sufficient to run maybe a light and uh, my computer. So, keep this in mind, as the reliability of the distribution system goes up, the cost to the utilities goes up, increases and the cost to the customer decreases. So, the total cost to the system as a whole we can say is the sum of the two. Obviously, somebody is paying the money, somebody is paying a price. So, the total cost would be sum of the two. So, where, so do I make the system 100 percent reliable? It is going to be very expensive. Is it worth it? So, what we do? We find a point where this cost is minimum, the total system cost because the cost to the as reliability increases, the cost to the utility is going up, cost to the consumer is coming down. So, there will be one point where the total cost is minimum, maybe reliability of around 98 percent or something. So, that would be the reliability we will try to achieve. So, that there is neither if it is smaller than that, utility will have to pay heavy price, sorry, customer will have to pay more, and if it is larger, utility will have to pay more. So, we come, come to a compromise. Look at this curve. So, as the system reliability improves, the cost of the it is not linear, huh? it is non linear because there are a number of factors which come into play. I told you there are so many components, you are talking of the reliability of a system. There are so many components, each of them have different life cycles, each of them have different wear and tear patterns, each of them have different maintenance requirements. So, Similarly, as reliability improves, the cost of the customer comes down. So, the total cost is the sum of these two and it has a point of minimum. So, this is the reliability I will try to achieve. The total system cost, we call it as cost to the society, that is the system. So, there are a few parameters we normally consider when we talk of reliability of a product, it could be any product, any component, right. First is the failure rate. How many times does the component fail in a unit time? The unit time could be a year, a month, a day, depending on what product you are talking of. If you are, if I am talking of my car, I say it, it hardly fails, in the past 5 years it has failed 2 times. So, 2, two for 5 years, 2 for every 5 years, right. So, that is called as a failure rate and it is denoted by lambda. Lambda is total number of failures divided by total test or operating time. So, 5, 2 failures per 5 years. So, total number of failures by the total operating time. So, on an average, so it is 2 by 5, 2 by 5. So, if I say there are 2 failures in a, for a period of 5 years, on an average I can say 2 and a half years is the time between 2 failures. So, I buy the product okay, and it fails after 2 and a half years, here it fails and then I get it repaired and again 2 and a half, again it fails, average uh, approximate because the first time it may have failed after 1 year and then the next uh, 4 years I may not have had a problem, but I need some numbers. So, the reciprocal of the failure rate is called as the mean time between failures, denoted commonly as MTBF, mean time between failures, mean roughly, okay. 
So, you buy a TV, you say this TV, my God, it is so troublesome. I bought it 2 years back and in 2 years it has failed 10 times. So, 10 by 2, 5 failures in 2 years. 2 by 10, 0.2 years is the mean time between 2 failures, successive failures. So, MTBF is 1 by lambda. So, I want lambda to be as small as possible, that means the failure rate, the new number of failures in a unit time should be very small and I want the me, me, MTBF to be large, that means the time between two successive failures should be really large, that is my wish for any product, any product. Now, here the product we are talking of is electrical power, electrical power. So, consider an example. So, I have a hard disk, it could be a circuit breaker, it could be a relay in a distribution system, it could be a fuse, wire and it could be a distributor, a line, any of the components we use in the distribution system. Consider a hard disks MTBF to be 8 into 10 to the power of 5 hours, that means the between 2 failures it is 8 into 10 to the power of 5 hours. What is the failure rate if 1 the disk is used 3000 hours in a year and the disk is used all the time continuously in a year. So, the failure rate also depends on use right. So, the mean time between failures is 8 into 10 to the power of 5 hours of use, hours of use. I am using it only for 3000 hours per year. So, how many years will it reach 8? So, in 266.67 years. Are you understanding? It takes 8 into 10 to the power of 5 hours for the hard disk to fail. Okay. In a year, I am using it for 3000 3, hours. In a year, I am using it for 3000 hours. So, to reach 8 into 10 to the power of 5 hours, how many years are required? 266.67 years. So, if I buy a hard disk now, after 266 years, it will have a failure. That is the meaning. And lambda is 1 by MTBF into 100, lambda is expressed in percentage, so it is 0.375 percent. So, this means that in a year on an average 0.375 percent of the disks will fail, okay. So, you can, you can, you can see how uh, reliable it is. So, now if I use, use the disk throughout the year continuously, the first case I used it for 3000 hours in a year, but now I use it continuously or throughout the year. So, the total number of hours in a year is 24 into 365 days. So, it is 8760. So, it is 91.32 years and now you see the failure rate has gone up 1 percent approximately. So, if I manufacture 100 disks, there is a probability, probability, one, per, one of them will fail in a year, okay. That is the meaning of these two parameters. So, these two parameters, you get it from statistics, manufacturing uh, experience, usage and is specified for all the major components. Now, the failure rate is not constant throughout, okay, because initially we have what is called as the teething problem. So, you just see any new, very often it happens, any new product you buy, you say you buy a TV, immediately after you buy the TV, you feel that the remote is not working properly, some channels you are not getting, something. So, you buy a car and then it is giving you very poor mileage. So, then immediately the mechanic will tell you, you run it for around 10,000 kilometers, then everything will be all right. So, lot of these components have to be used 
for them to settle to an equilibrium operation. And then you use it for some time. Then what has happened wear and tear has occurred. So again the performance will deteriorate. So the failure rate is not constant throughout the life cycle of the product. So how do I represent this? There are some standard curves. The first is called as the bathtub curve. The bathtub is like this, right? This is the bathtub. So during the initial phase, failure rates will be large, which diminish as the errors are debugged and rectified. During the working life, failure rates are reduced and random failures you will have. And towards the end of the life cycle, more failures will occur. That is a wear out phase. And then after that wear out phase, after some time of the wear out phase, what happens? It is no longer economical to keep the product because you have to keep repairing it. You have to keep repairing it. So, it is no longer economical. So, you discard the product. You say the life cycle has ended. The life cycle has ended. So, you see here, this is the failure rate. Initially, the failure rate is high. It is called as infant mortality. It happens in us also. A child is sick. There are a lot of children who are very sick when they are born. And then you keep going to the doctor and something they say the lungs are weak, something is weak and then it will it'll all get rectified as the child grows. So, slowly those illnesses reduce. And then during the normal life, useful life, the failure rate is low and more or less a constant. This is a failure rate, huh? y axis is failure rate. Then after some time, the product has become old, so failure will be more and then the failure rate will go up and then you decide how much failure rate you are ready to take and at that point you discard the product. At that time you discard the product. This is called as the life cycle, the life cycle bathtub curve, bathtub curve very popularly used for various products. The second one is what is called as a constant failure during working phase and a Gaussian failure during wear out. So, you see here during wear out it is like this. So, some random failures occur. So, any random occurrence follows a Gaussian function. This is a kind of a model. We are trying to build a mathematical model for failure rates. Okay. Here the failure rate is assumed to be constant during the working phase similar to your bathtub here and then during the wear out phase it is a Gaussian. Random failures occur. So, this is another kind of response for failure. And the third one is a real life failure rate curve. So, the bath curve, bathtub curve is a good model, but realistically what happens? Slightly there will be ups and downs. So, both the two previous curves are not perfectly true in real life. So, what happens in the active phases some, some period the failure rate is more or less so on because some random failures occur which you cannot predict. So, this is one other curve. This is called as a real life failure curve, failure rate curve where it is not perfectly a straight line, but slight undulations are there. Okay. This is what it happens, but this is difficult to model mathematically because I do not know exactly how those uh, changes takes place. So, as an approximation, we can use the bathtub curve. Now, probability distributions apply to reliability. So, the first one is exponential or Poisson distribution. So, this distribution is used to model a product which has a constant failure rate. So, during the active phase you can model using the Poisson's distribution. It has a fairly simple mathematical form and very easy to manipulate, but however it is not very accurate. 
So, here if you see the failure rate is given by lambda, we saw what is lambda, the failure per unit time into e to the power of minus lambda t, the failure rate with respect to time, whenever you talk of rate it is with respect to time is given by lambda e to the power of minus lambda t where lambda is the constant rate of failure. So, in the bathtub model you have that. Okay. So, for different values of lambda you can see how the curve goes. So, this is for lambda is equal to 0 0.01, lambda is equal to 0 0.005, fairly easy to model. So, you, if you know lambda, how do I get lambda? You just observe the product, you see how many failures has occurred over some time period like I told you 2 failures in 5 years, so 2 by 5 okay, or 1 failure in 10 years, so 0 0.1, you can find out. Or if you take a product, let us say I have a batch, I may make a batch of 10,000 numbers of a particular product and out of that 10,000 in one year 500 fail, so 500 by 10,000. So, you can get the value of lambda and this is the response you would get. Then you can also have a normal or Gaussian distribution. So, a lot of components in the distribution sector the properties like insulation strength, the dielectric strength, mechanical strength, etcetera, overhead lines, insulators, they all normally the failure follows this. Okay. Then you also have a log normal distribution. So, this model is used when the physical fatigue is the main contributor to failure. Physical fatigue means mechanical stress, maybe due to vibrations due to strain, due to tension. So, here the failure rate increases initially and then decreases and then decreases eventually approaching 0. So, over voltages due to lightning and over current magnitudes they all obey this distribution. It is not lighting, it is lightning. Next we have a binomial distribution very popular in mathematics, I am sure you have studied all this distribution in probability theory in maths. So, this is again popularly used. Supposing P is the probability that a product fails after t years. So, you know if P is the probability it fails 1 minus P is the probability that it will not fail that is Q, right. If P is the probability of failure, 1 minus P is the probability of it being in a working condition. So, supposing I have n such devices, right, then out of these n devices, the probability that x will fail is given by the binomial distribution. What is that? n factorial by x factorial into n minus x factorial p to the power of x, q to the power of n minus x. So, let us be very clear about the terms here, n is the total number of items. Let us say I have insulators, let us take the case of insulator. So, let us say I have 10,000 insulators, 10,000 just, just to understand what, what this means, 10,000 insulators and x let us say 100, x let us say 100. Now, P is the probability of one insulate of an insulator failing in one year. So, Q is the probability of the insulator not failing that is operating. Therefore, if I have 10,000 insulators, what is the probability of 100 insulators failing in a year if P is equal to say 0 0.05? Are you, are you getting what this? Uh, binomial distribution means. So, n is large number of devices out of that some amount x, what is the probability that x will fail. So, because you do not manufacture single products many of them no? in for example, in power systems I do not manufacture one insulator, I manufacture hundreds thousands of insulators. I do not manufacture one circuit breaker, we manufacture thousands of them. So, if I manufacture say 10,000 or, or 100,000, what is the probability that 10 of them will fail in one year? That is what this binomial distribution tells you. So, the standard deviation and mean of the distribution are given by 
mean is n p, n is the total number of devices and p is the probability of failure and the standard deviation is root of n p q. These are standard formulae in maths. Then you have similarly like binomial distribution, you have Poisson's distribution. Here f of x is given by e to the power of minus mu, mu to the power of x by x factorial. So, the standard is this deviation for this is root of mu. Now, we calculate something called as the reliability or survival function. It is a probability that x is equal to 0 or no failures occur. I manufacture 10,000 products and not even one of them fail, no failures occur. So, there it is given by e to the power of minus lambda t that is equal to e to the power of minus t by mtbf mean time between failures this is because this is equal to 1 by lambda. It is exponentially decreasing. So, it means that the reliability decreases with time if we consider a time equal to mtbf the probability that the device will operate satisfactory after one cycle is around 37 percent e e to the power of minus 1 that is 0.37 37 percent that is if t is equal to mtbf mean time between failures what is the meaning of that take the same case i told you my car two times in five years it has failed. So, mean time is two and a half years. So, what is the probability that the device is still operating after two and a half years because it is mean no when you talk of mean it is averages. So, every product need not follow that. So, what is the probability that my car is still operating after two years? The probability is 37 percent because T is 2.5, MTBF is 2.5. So, e to the power of minus 1 37 percent. So, if there are on an average 2 failures for 5 years, then the probability of my item operating after 2 and half years satisfactorily is 37 percent. That is the meaning. Now, uh, let us look at a video by Hitachi, where they have shown how the company is enabling improvement of reliability and sustainability through automation. Automation of the distribution sector greatly enhances the reliability, greatly enhances the reliability. So, this video is available on YouTube and let us acknowledge YouTube for having it made it available to us. I want you all to watch this video to get an idea of what automation can do to improve reliability. You have another very good video on the power system reliability again available on YouTube and thanks to them we all can watch it. So, kindly watch both these videos and they would give you an exposure to practical aspects involved in establishing and improving the reliability of the power sector. So, when we define reliability, we use certain indices. These are standard for any product, just like how lambda, MTBF, they are all standard for any product. We are using them for products in the distribution or in the power sector. Similarly, these indices are also general. So, I have something called as SAD, System Average Interruption Duration Index look at the word, SAID is an acronym, the system whatever system you are talking of, average, mean, interruption, duration, index. So, this is the index measures the average value of interruption a customer faces in so many minutes per customer. So, let us say I have a system and my system is servicing many customers just like the distribution sector is making electrical power available to a number of customers. 
So, what is the probability that this index will tell you what is the average value of interruption of service every customer has to face per customer. Okay. So, it is defined as sigma r i into n i by n t. This is the calculation, this is how you calculate. Okay. So, what is r i? The restoration time in minutes. So, my supply goes off, how much time does it take to restore it? This is also the time for which the voltage or power is interrupted. If it takes 5 minutes for the power to be restored means 5 minutes I am without power. Right? N i is the number of customers affected and N t is the total number of customers. What this means is this. Let us say I have a distribution substation and it is servicing say 1000 customers, 1000 houses, 1000 customers. Okay? There is a power interruption of 5 minutes. So, 5 minutes is the time taken for the power to be restored. And during this interruption, 100 customers have been affected. Got it? So, NT, the total number of customers is 1000. NI, the number of customers affected is 100. And RI is the restoration time in minutes, that is 5 minutes. So, it will be 5 into 100 by 1000. Okay. Take an example. Assume a distribution company is supplying 50,000 customers and there are two interruptions in a day. The first interruption is for 30 minutes affecting 400 customers and the second is 45 minutes affecting 1000 customers. Then what is SEDI? Say, so, remember is the average value of interruption per customer that, that does not mean that all the customers are affected. It is just an average value. Okay? It is just like I am earning 1000 rupees, you are earning 500 rupees. So, our average is 1000 plus 500 by 2 something like that. So, here I have 30 minutes this is R i affecting 400 customers N i plus sigma 45 minutes affecting 1000 customers. So, the numerator is sigma r i n i divided by total number of customers is 50,000. So, I have 1.14 minute per customer. So, what this implies is on an average there is a loss of power of 1.14 minutes per customer it is an index, right? but that does not mean that 1.14 minutes 50,000 customers are affected, no. You see the data, 30 minutes 400 customers are affected, 45 minutes 1000 customers are affected, but on an average 1.14 minutes every customer in the system is affected. That is the meaning of this index, say D. Then I have K D customer average interruption duration index. So, this is, this makes better sense because it tells you it only takes into account the customers who are affected. It takes into account only customers who are affected. So, you see the denominator in the previous case was NT, but out of 50,000 only around 40, around 1000 and 400 were affected. So, it makes more sense to calculate the interruption time only taking into account the number of customers affected. Therefore, the denominator instead of n t it is sigma n i. So, the numerator is the same 30 into 400. So, 30 minutes 400 customers, 45 minutes 1000 customers and the total customers affected is 400 plus 1000, 1400. So, it is 142.5 minutes per customer, per customer who are affected, that is all. This means on an average any customer who was without service, that means the per customer who was affected had an interruption for 
42.5 minutes. So, this actually you know if you look at this, this is sort of misleading because if I am a customer and somebody the utility gives me this, I say okay, it is okay. Uh, maximum I will have loss of power for 1.14 minutes in a day, but this number tells me that if I am one of the customers who is affected then I will have a loss of 142 minutes, you see. So, the two give you entirely a different uh, feel and there are some more indices which we will see that is SIFI and KIFI in the next session, thank you.